People are teaching the machine, the machine is teaching the people, and both are getting better and better at generating more knowledge, more possibilities, ultimately we hope more conservation. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, about 45 million Americans are considered birders. People who enjoy bird watching can provide valuable citizen science observations for tracking population movement and health, as migration brings birds into new areas throughout the year. Today, birders of all experience can use an app called Merlin to identify birds in the wild from their mobile devices. We are joined by Miyoko Chu, Senior Director of Communications at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where Merlin was developed. Dr. Chu, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Nate. This is going to be fun. Definitely. Uh, we're, there's a couple of users on the team here, and we're very excited to talk about the app. Can you give us a short overview of the work that's in general done at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology? Yes. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a nonprofit conservation organization, and our mission is to just increase the understanding and protection of birds and biodiversity. Uh, and we do that in a couple of different ways. We do it through research, uh, through education, which involves K-12 all the way through lifelong learning, uh, through participatory science, where people can contribute to science, and then also on-the-ground conservation. So one of the ways people participate is with this app. It's called Merlin. Can you tell us a little bit about that app? Yeah. So the origin of Merlin went back to um, about 2009. Uh, we were right at the tail end of a major recession at that time. And um, our team here at the Lab of Ornithology was, was wondering, you know, how can we find some funding to do more to engage people uh, in our websites um, all about birds. So we sat down and we had heard about this NSF opportunity, a grant that could be available in informal science education. And we said, what could we do that could be valuable? And we noticed that when you look at our All About Birds website, which is like the online encyclopedia of birds, uh, and you, you looked at what people were typing into the search box, it was things like, uh, little brown bird with a white line uh, and a red bird with a crest. You know, so there were these descriptors where clearly people were trying to identify birds using our website as a bird identification tool. But that's not the most useful tool uh, to help you ID birds, although if you spent a while, maybe you could figure it out. So it happened that one of the developers on our team said, you know what I think we need to do? I've seen this online game about 21 questions where the computer guesses what you're thinking uh, based on questions um, that or clues uh, that it, it, you provide it. And that was just at the beginning of AI really taking off. Like I hadn't really seen applications of AI before, but we said, wow, a computer can guess what you're thinking in 21 questions? That sounds neat. Can't we do that for birds? So that was the start of the idea, the nugget of the idea, when we decided to write this NSF proposal. Can we do something like a 21 questions for birds and help people identify it without having to enter that in our search box <laughs> for our website? So, so reading through that, that grant abstract, was this concept originally supposed to be another website before it went to mobile devices? I think we thought of it as an enhancement to the All About Birds website. So you come to the site, we already know you're interested in birds. Now that we've seen what people are searching for, we have a pretty good idea. A lot of people want to ID them. So I think what we envisioned was something on the website that would prompt you and would say, welcome. It looks like you're trying to identify a bird. Where are you? Uh, what uh, is the, the date when you saw the bird? Um, what colors did you see? What was the bird doing? How big was the bird? And we envisioned that the website would then pop out the answer for you. I guess I was thinking back to uh, NSF's role, right, in funding this type of work, making it possible, um, and how, as a program officer at NSF, right, how are you thinking about these proposals as they come through? 
So I remember that our program officer, David Hanich at the time, um, had really read through this proposal and thought that it had potential. Um, and I would say there were probably skeptics uh, in the group of proposal reviewers, some of whom weren't sure that in terms of informal science learning, how much is, th an, is an app like this really going to help someone learn if it's just telling them the answers? Um, and I remember him um, saying that he took a field guide into a meeting to just kind of explain how this type of learning with an app could differ from a book. And I remember him telling me that he, he thought this could be, this could really be revolutionary for how people interact with birds and learn about them. So I really appreciated at the time, you know, the role of NSF in being able to take a risk on an idea um, of course, to be rigorous about evaluating how likely it, it could actually be successful. But uh, the fact that NSF did fund it uh, made all the difference. We would not have been able to step into it otherwise. And then about a month after our program officer had written with a bit of this uh, encouragement about one of our early reports, he unexpectedly passed away. And uh, I just wish that he had a chance to see Merlin pan out and be where it is today and to fulfill what I think he saw into the future uh, when he read that proposal. Absolutely. Was the machine learning aspect always in play? It was because, uh, as France, our developer, had initially suggested, right, the idea was that we would use artificial intelligence to help understand what people were saying, and that our initial idea was that based on the clues they were giving us, maybe the computer wouldn't get it the first time mm. around, but they, you know, but we could help feed it the answers until it got smart enough to perform better. So that was the, the theory. Right. And like for myself, I moved across the country basically right at the pandemic, and we started going outside where it's safe see lots of new birds that I'm not familiar with. My wife's like, hey, I bet there's an app that'll help you figure out what that is. We find the Merlin app. So this kind of regional packages that you have in there is very useful for narrowing it down. Because I mean, like like when you're talking about someone searching into the, the website, small brown bird, that could be almost thousands of birds probably. Uh, so the idea of these regional packs, um, was that more of a data, like narrowing it down for users, or was that more a way to offset some of the data storage? I would say both, definitely. Uh, so one nice thing about the Merlin app is that it's filled with rich media. You know, it's got photos and sounds in it, and so those files can get to be pretty big. If we put all of that for all the world's birds, it would be a pretty heavy uh, download for your for your phone. Uh, but also what we learned is that um, part of the secret to Merlin, we actually didn't have to end up using artificial intelligence for the step-by-step -step function in Merlin, which is this question, the five questions. And the reason is that we have a citizen science project called eBird. And in that project, People from all around the world tell us what birds they're seeing, how many, and using that information, we can help whittle down pretty quickly based on your location and your date, what you are likely to be seeing. So those packs really help because instead of trying to answer these questions for 10,000 birds, maybe we're looking at several hundred uh, who are most likely to be there at your location on that date. So yes, it helps with both. Fantastic. Um, what has been, like, it's been pretty successful for you guys, right? What has been the user reaction in the general public? I have to say I'm completely astounded just by how many people have started to use it. So you mentioned finding it during the pandemic. I think we saw a lot of growth at that time. Um, but the reaction has just been delight and um, just like, Delight and a sense of, um, I don't know, new possibilities, because as soon as people realize that they can use this app to give them the name of something that they've seen or heard, 
it just becomes much more tangible. Once you have the name, you can learn so much more about it because all of a sudden you can Google that and you can learn all kinds of interesting facts about it. So it really opens a door. And the way we always wanted Merlin to feel was as if it was your personal coach, that you were just outside, that you saw something that mystified you, and that your coach would just be right there with you to help you, you know, give a name to it so that you could learn more. Beyond the five questions, there's now a couple different things that got introduced over the years to the app. One is the photo ID function. Can we start with what is the photo or what are you able to use the photo ID for and what is the public response to that been? Well, yeah, this is where we do get into um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So with the Merlin app, you can choose the function to ID a photo. And if you get a photo, um, Merlin will just identify it based on visual recognition. And I would say today that probably seems more commonplace. There's a lot of apps now that can do that for different kinds of objects, for facial recognition of people, obviously, as well as different plants and animals. But at the time, there were really very few of any apps that could do that well, and certainly not for birds. Um, and so it was really exciting about this collaboration is that we uh, worked with um, a lab at the time at UC San Diego uh, who were doing a project called Visipedia. And if I remember correctly, I think they were focused on butterflies and maybe fungi. But the processes that you use are the same, regardless of what you're looking at. And we were very fortunate to have uh, Grant Van Horn from that lab and Serge Belanger, who uh, helped us develop that specifically for Merlin. Uh, so in terms of the reaction, it's just great to see people having fun uh, getting that mystery bird on their phone, having the you know suggestions pop up about what it is, it just makes it so much easier. Now, one of the other developments since then is an audio, a sound ID portion. Can you talk a little bit about that bit of it? Yeah, I feel like this one was a real game changer because identifying birds by sound is like the, oh, the holy grail. A lot of people hear sound all the time it can be really difficult to spot the bird often. And so it can be really like, you know, frustrating because you keep hearing it and you just never get that great look. Uh, so people had been asking us for a long time, well, why don't you just do the Shazam for birds? You know, why can't you just do that? You can already do an entire song, why not birds? Well, it turns out that the challenge is much greater with birds than with songs on the radio. And that's because standard songs, they're, they're the same each time. And so that you can train the computer on that very well. But birds have variation in their song. Uh, there's regional variation. And also there's a lot of background noise that confuses these algorithms. And so honestly, the breakthrough came when rather than trying to train the computer based on the acoustic properties of the sound, our scientists trained Merlin based on the picture of the sound. So it's really similar to photo ID, except Merlin's looking at the picture of the sound. Uh, and once they figured that out, uh, it actually went really quickly to train uh, Merlin how to recognize these sounds. And when I say game changer, I mean, as soon as that feature became available, we saw the download rate go up, the usage go up, the enthusiasm go up. Uh, so many people tell us that that has been phenomenal. Uh, and we also get really nice comments from people who may be visually impaired or who may have hearing loss, who are also using that in a way to enhance their experience. Because not only can you upload a sound, you can play back sounds from the birds too. You're like, oh, I think it's this one, but is it this one? You can do a little bit of that. Yeah, it, Merlin has a built-in field guide, and that includes um, sound, standard sounds of each bird that you could play. Very cool. So how is all this data being used for conservation efforts? Yeah, so that is a wonderful question. Uh, so in Merlin, if you identify a bird, you can keep your own list within the app that uh, reminds you of which birds you've seen. Those data are not contributed into our database. It's really just for you and you know your 
keepsake. But um, Merlin does give you an option to join eBird. And eBird is a participatory science project where no matter where you are in the world, any time of year, you can upload the checklist of the birds that you see into eBird. And eBird now has more than a million participants and nearly 2 billion observations. And that is an incredibly powerful source to help us understand the 11,000 bird species on Earth and how they're doing uh, day to day, year to year. Uh, and also gives us a lot of rich information that conservationists can use for decisions about managing populations, about addressing threats, and ensuring that we have healthy bird populations wherever possible. One of the most beautiful ways that Merlin works is by combining the power of millions of people's efforts and their observations with the power of machines. So if you think about it, no single scientist could tell you which species of birds are likely to be seen at this moment for every location in the world. And there's no single scientist who could be in the field with 5 million people all over the world at the same time as they're listening to sounds. They can't help you do that individually, but machines can. However, it's only because of the millions of people that the machines can do that. And so it's this phenomenal loop where people are teaching the machine, the machine is teaching the people, and both are getting better and better at generating more knowledge, more possibilities. Ultimately, we hope more conservation. Right. That's a massive data set. So, I mean, a lot of the times... If someone's doing a study, they're looking at a specific species or, or fault, like maybe you're watching migration a little bit, but it's kind of specific kind of bird. And you get a lot more information this way, I would think. Well, yeah. I mean, the beauty of it is that um, eBird does have a network of volunteer reviewers. So they do screen for that data quality, which is super important. They collect the data in such a way that it's very useful for scientific analyses. There's actually, you know, you have to answer questions and conduct your checklist in a certain way that informs scientists about the quality of the data. And the other neat thing about it is that you can also upload photos and sounds. So it's not just sightings. And that also adds another rich dimension into what can be done with the data, including, I would say, powering Merlin itself. Because in order for this photo ID and the sound ID features to work, you need to teach Merlin, you know, what a mockingbird sounds like. And so you need a lot of recordings of mockingbirds. Uh, and um, eBird is a wonderful source of those data. What would you like the Merlin app to impact in the next few years? Like, how do you see this advancing? Yeah, well, so Merlin works really well in parts of the world where we have the most data so far, the most information, especially the, for the photo and sound that we can use to train Merlin to be accurate. But there's still parts of the world where we are working on rolling out those features. So that would be one big part of the app to just make it more universally available um, uh, across all of its features. I would say we're also thinking about language. So mm -hmm. if we could wave a magic wand, it would be easier for more people to consume all of our content uh, in all languages. Um, and we also, you know, from the beginning have had this notion about Merlin being the coach who's with you. Um, we think there's a lot more opportunity for Merlin to teach you how it thinks or how you might want to uh, consider how your observations can help you with your own learning or maybe take a next step with your birding or your participation. Uh, we really think uh, of people as going on a lifelong journey. We hope Merlin is a part of that, but we hope uh, Merlin can take your hand and lead you to some other things you might be interested in. Special thanks to Miyoko Chu. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov. <laughs>